Um, so the data that was recorded on those knots um, in this picture that is in the background is the actual kipu. Um, it's accounting data. Uh, calendrical kipu uh, was discovered five years ago approximately. And um, in chronicles, oftentimes you see mentions about uh, narrative narratives and myths and uh, religion and genealogy of the Incas. However, we don't know how to read those um, type of kipus, unfortunately, but hopefully one day. Um, so currently, there is a kipu research database developed by Gary Erton from Harvard University. Um, currently, he's the chair of the Department of Anthropology there. And in 2009, uh, him and his, at the time, undergraduate student, Carrie Bresnan, they developed a database with um, a, with the values of, of those knots. In, in the database, you are able to see what color each chord is, uh, what the value, because each, keeps, each, each chord <laughs> symbolized the value, and furthermore, I'll show you how th that works, um, and, um, and the directionality of a chord. So a lot, of, a lot of different data. However, the main problem with that is that there are very few scholars who are able to work with it because to understand Kipu, first of all, you have to be fluent in Spanish because you probably have to work with the Spanish Chronicles that occasionally mention um, this tool. And uh, you also have to be fluent, hopefully, or at least have basic knowledge of Quechua language, the main language of the Inca Empire. And you have to have a pretty, uh, pretty extensive knowledge of statistics and preferably programming. So very few anthropologists and archaeologists are able to uh, apply those tools and, and have that kind of a wide knowledge of different subjects that are oftentimes not related to one another. And the database is available in MySQL format and um, also in Excel. And uh, what I work with Kipu is I prefer to use the Excel files because I process the Kipu in MATLAB, which is a MATLAB is a is an environment that allows usually engineers or physicists to process gobs and gobs of data and visualize it. It's especially popular among structural engineers because you can see the data in 3D. But um, but I use it for statistics. However, you can also use R. R is free of charge, but a lot of people complain about R, so my, my software preference is MATLAB. And um, so Kipu Database gave an unparalleled access to this wonderful knowledge because a lot of Kipus are placed in museums all over the world. And previously, um, two scientists from Cornell University, and another one's actually from Ithaca College, but they all live in Ithaca, both of them live in Ithaca, they developed um, something similar to Kipu Database, and they developed it in the 70s, and, and it was called the Osher's Data Book. And those two scientists, they're married to one another, so that's why um, in uh, the Indian studies, we call them the Oshers. So they developed a data book full of data on Kipus, but the problem is that the data book is, is in a microfilm format, and you would have to order it from Cornell University, and that's, 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 they have only two copies or three copies available. So imagine a microfilm. I when I first when I had to work with it first, I, I was kind of puzzled because it's really hard to find a microfilm reader these days, and um, it's so it's not the best format. So Gary Erden he traveled all over, all over the world, and um, also scholars who work with him they traveled all over the world and recorded kipus, and so he created a fresh database with his own data that is independent from the ushers but you can always compare his with the Osher's. Um, and of course, they're very similar because it's the same, the same kipus. And overall, right now, there are uh, around 800 kipus that exist in the world because a lot of them were destroyed uh, during the colonial times. There was the Third Council of Lima that ordered to uh, destroy the, all the kipus because they were associated as, they represented the power of the Incas, and the Spaniards had to get rid of that symbol of power because an informational <coughs> tool is a, is a great is a great source of knowledge and power. So, uh, the first one of the first things that the Spaniards did, they uh, ordered it to be destroyed. However, for some time they tried to use it, and um, since it's a very precise tool, they they use it for accounting, for keeping the tribute, the the labor, the um, logistics 
the trend, uh, distribution of goods throughout the empire. So in the beginning, they were actually using the Kipu masters for providing them with that data. And eventually, Kipu <coughs> got destroyed. But we still have 800 samples. And approximately, there are 300 plus samples in the database. And a lot of samples are actually <coughs> private collections in Europe. So if you know someone who's willing to share, that'll be great. We're, we'll, be, we'll all be very excited to uh, look at that keyboard. So what it looks like. Basically, um, there's one main cord, and there are uh, smaller cords attached to the main cord, and there are two different types of attachments. And these terms are typical for textile terminology. So if you're an archaeologist who works in textiles, you'll probably understand what I'm talking about. So basically, imagine my hand is the main cord, and the cords, the other cords are, are um, attached either in um, verso or recto um, attachment style. So there is also there is also the S, Z, ply, and spin of the cord. That's another interesting parameter for us to study. But uh, in this particular example that I will give you, um, we will look at versa and recto attachment. And at first you would think, oh, how significant is it? Some kind of an attachment of a cord to or not? Like, well, why does it matter? But um, the kipus, the way the information was encoded in kipu, it was actually binary. And right now a lot of researchers come to the idea that it was more of an, in a 3D format. So you didn't just use the color of, of the cord or uh, a number of knots. You were actually using a lot of different parameters in order to encode and read that information. Um, <clears throat> So these are the different colors. There are um, two types of uh, coloration of a cord. Um, and the color of a cord could be just one straight color, or it could be spliced into two. Uh, it could be barber pole, so it looks like a barber pole. And, uh, and a modeled, it's when um, initially during the spin and the ply, um, the textile was actually uh, mixed up into different colors. So by the time the keep them mastered, that's what they're called, the catch word is kipu kamayuk, but it's super, super long, so I don't want to <laughs> overload you guys with information. So they would actually, uh, they would actually take a pre-prepared uh, cord and, and choose the color when they wanted to encode the information. Um, so, so what the traditional structure of kipu looks like. So um, this is my, um, this is my attempt to, at understanding. Adobe Illustrator, so please don't judge me. I know that I don't have any future in, in, in fine arts, but I, I tried my best. So maybe in Kipo, some chance. So um, so the first uh, the first level, imagine those pretty pretty bits that they're actually knots. I tried to portray knots through that. Um, so the first level is thousands, the second level is hundreds, and then tens, and then units. So if we look at the first chord, uh, we can see that it's 1,233. Um, so that's how you would read that. And that's how uh, a Kipu master would read accounting information. It was, it was an accounting Kipu. Um, but a lot of Kipu, as we say, they were actually narrative. So then it gets more complicated than just a simple scheme. Um, there are so-called subcords, a little cords that are attached to other cords, and in the Kipo database, uh, database they are coded as U. So um, in my future example, when you see U, um, it, it means it's that little subcord that's attached to the other cord, and U means unknown because it's sometimes it's hard to read what they mean, and, and it's it's a big debate right now in Kipo studies what the what the unknowns are and how to count them. So We'll just kind of exclude them uh, from, we won't pay too much attention to those, but um, I will still, for the purposes of statistics, I will still include them in the sample. So uh, I took, from the Kipa database, I took um, a random sample of um, the Kipos from these areas that you can see of, of Peru. They were found in those areas. And, um, and the main question was, Will I find a pattern? Will I find something that is um, a recurring, a recurring kind of pattern throughout different kipus that come from uh, different areas of Peru? Um, and some of them are actually found in Bolivia and Chile, but the ones in the sample are from modern day Peru. And and if I do find a pattern, that means that kipus are actually standardized. 
because some scholars argue, oh, all those, all those knots, they don't really mean that much because a Kipu master could just come up with some coding you know, mechanism or idea and, and, and code it the way he wanted it. But that's not true because some of them seem to have uh, patterns and, and if I can prove the statistics that this is the case, then yes, actually there is the standardization across different areas of the Inca Empire, and at least this is one of, one of the patterns that um, are occurring. So uh, in, I use MATLAB, and MATLAB, um, I don't know if anybody worked with MATLAB, but um, the information is coded into a, a matrix. So um, what I do, I put the UVR, V being verse attachment, R being rect attachment, and U is unknown. Um, so one, the X axis, let's say for example, X axis or Y, doesn't matter, is the attachment type, and Y axis is the value, because each chord has the value expressed with knots. Um, and the Z value will be their distribution, so how they are correlated will be the, the third dimension in MATLAB. I know it sounds like so boring, but this is, you have to do that stuff for understanding those sophisticated ancient uh, systems of communication, who would have thought? Um, so um, first I plot the data in MATLAB, and um, as you can see, there are a lot of peaks um, on the values of 10, 20, 50. The ink has used a demo system of um, counting. Um, so even their labor was organized in, in, in uh, five units of ten people, and then those five units were divided into two, and then again they represented ten, and there were five subunits of ten. So basically, it was a ten-base system. I won't get too much into the detail here, but it was a ten-base system of communication. Um, and um, then I um, bootstrapped this data and divided the values by 10, so it's pretty logical to get the logarithmic value uh, because it was a 10-based system. And what, what it also means in accounting, that means that oftentimes, for example, they had nine workers, but they will round up this number to 10 because, because they're, uh, the, the ink is expected to see the 10-based the value. So the Kipo accountants would actually not make out, but sort of balance out the numbers up to 10. And you can also see those men uh, mentions of that phenomenon in the Chronicles. And if you see, you look at the Kibu, uh values themselves, you, you see that even modern days account accountants do that. They, they uh, approximate, so, so the values will balance out. Um, and uh, so here you can see the U, V, and R. And um, all these distributions, the main phenomenon, you can see that U clearly stands out. It's, it's so, so far away from all the other ones um, that what does this mean? That means that the values of V are recurrently significantly higher than the values of either U or R. And this is the distribution of all the chords except for V. Uh, for v. So in comparison to all, all these U and R chords, V clearly stands out. So this is a pattern, this is an obvious pattern, and um, unfortunately we don't have a Kipu Rosetta Stone to claim what that actually means, but it could be anything. It could be, um, it could be for example, debit or credit or, or, or something that was, that was predominantly higher. Or for example, the Incas were big fans of counting labor. It could, it could represent labor as well. That's why it's so high. Or you know, we can we can guess, but but from the hard data, we can see that this is a recurrent pattern of V being significantly significantly higher. And then I did another sample, and the same thing happened. The V um, also stood out. The here the um, the graph is not as pretty, but but at least I played with the colors. Um, so, um, and now finally I will um, touch upon open access. Having an open access database, what does that mean? Because um, Keeper Research Database is an open access, it's sponsored by National Science Foundation and one of the requirements of that grant is to have it open access. 
And on one hand, it's definitely the education of the general audience about the kibbutz. It's elimination of elitism. So previously, only um, only researchers or scholars from certain institutions who would get permission to work in those museums would be able to see people. And plus, those researchers will have to have so much money and so many grants as they so they would be able to travel all over the world to see the people because a lot of people are located in Berlin, a lot of people are located all across the United States, and a lot of them are located all across Europe and South America. So imagine from the financial standpoint how hard that is to actually have access to this data. And so yes, it does certainly um, um, eliminate elitism and provide enough uh, opportunities for other people to research the subject. However, here comes the uh, question of reputation uh, and the credibility, how credible the results of those researchers are, it's a good question. But from the Kipo database experience, since it requires a lot of knowledge of statistics and maybe some computer pro programming, and then you'll have to read a lot of colonial records, a lot of already available um, articles on the subject, very few people can actually sit down and, and work with that. So in, in people studies, so called, we, we have very few people, and one of them is currently, his name is Frank Salomon, retiring, unfortunately. Next week, week he's going to be commemorated at the American Anthropological Association in um, at, at San Francisco. Um, so unfortunately, he's retiring, and there are very few people. There are, no, there are literally three people right now working in this area in the United States and one person in uh, Finland. So, um, so yes, this is, by default, it's not the most popular subject, unfortunately. But um, if you look at Maya studies, for example, there's FAMSI. FAMSI is a popular website for uh, Maya scholars. <coughs> and there they face a problem of, um, I have a lot of Maya friends, and they always tell me stories about crazy people emailing them about the 2012 end of the world, and I feel so sorry for them. I feel so thrilled that I have to deal with that stuff, <laughs> but they do. They do have to face a lot of, you know, people who are into sci-fi and things like that, and partially that's because a lot of codices became available to the general audience, and, and people with very rich fantasy of, you know, cre creativity in their brain, they, they like to engage in that kind of studies. So I feel sorry for the minus. Um, and um, right now, so this is, this is the Keep project. And while preparing for this conference, I noticed that a lot of papers were on Twitter and um, social media. So I decided to share a little bit of my experience because my other research project is actually uh, based on studying the modern media and Twitter and studying them quantitatively because as you can understand, I'm a big fan of MATLAB. And, uh, and I think a big uh, question here is how to quantify the data that we get from social media. This is not easy, uh, it's all subjective, but to get published, you can't just you know, capture a couple of tweets and come up with some conclusions or, or just write your observations. You have to actually provide uh, some sort of quantitative methodology for publication. And um, in the United States right now, one of the mo most popular methodologies, methodologies come from uh, 2011 Mason Golder article in Science Magazine where they analyzed thousands and thousands of tweets um, and they analyzed the mood fluctuations of people from different parts of the world. And you can find this article if you Google Science Magazine and Twitter. This is going to come up. It's the only article right now on Twitter in such a big journal. And, um, and so in this talk, I decided to apply that methodology and research the word archaeology right before the conference. So basically, <coughs> my point here is to show you this methodology that is currently used by a lot of researchers of social media and, um, and social scientists and also computer scientists. So in case you decide to actually quantitatively understand your Twitter data, you will have uh, the scientific method that is accepted by the scientific community. So it's not just some you know, made up and whatever. This is actually the method. So first of all, you need to deal with the Twitter API. Twitter API allows you to uh, record tweets. It has some limitations and it's free of charge. You get uh, the unique code for your for your name. 
So one person cannot have two API access codes. That's illegal. It means that you're breaking the Twitter policy. And per day, one person can record 500,000 tweets, which is terrible because um, one project that I did was the London <coughs> Olympics closing ceremony, and right now I'm processing the data from that. London Olympics closing ceremony on Twitter, 30 minutes, and you run off that limit. It's Yeah, it's done. You have 500,000 tweets, but the ceremony is still going on, and the Spice Girls are there, and people are tweeting and all, all emotional about it, and how am I going to lose this opportunity? I, I can't. So um, that then you have to find some alternative uh, methods, and there are currently only two companies in the world that have access to Twitter data, and they also have access to historic Twitter data. And one is called, I think, Gip or something like that. Some funny name, and the other one is the one I use, so I know their name very well because I've been um, we've been having a good um, communication and uh, mutual co collaboration for the past seven months. So, and the third being the Library of Congress because Twitter donated um, tweets from the day one to the Library of Congress, and at some point they will become available to the researchers. Currently, Library of Congress is still working on setting up the system for that, um, but they're still not available for the library. And um, I'm using DataSift, and funny enough, it's a UK-based company. But uh, from my understanding, some of the people who uh, funded the startup, they come from the Silicon Valley because they have uh, a lot of executives who are based in Palo Alto. And their, mar they, their main market is in the United States because, for example, finance industry, um, it's, 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 there's a high demand right now because in finance, if you can measure the emotions of people and opinions of certain brands and companies, that means that you can probably predict how the stocks are, are going to do in, uh, on the market. And I don't know how exactly they do that, but somehow they can calculate and predict. Maybe that's why the economy is getting better because they're capturing those tweets, hopefully. Um, and then the step two, so. So once you, you, you figured out what keywords you're going to look for, I, I was going to look for the word archaeology right before the conference. And, um, and then you have to decide if you want to capture them in English or in some other languages. And these are the languages that I chose. And then you have to write the code in um, data set, it's CSDL language. So I coded, wrote the code for those two languages. And unfortunately, <laughs> they captured approximately two. Well, here, here I made a little mistake. Uh, what I did, I asked them to capture the data not only from Twitter, but also from um, from Instagram, uh, Hootsuite. Hootsuite is a platform for, they, you can send tweets from Hootsuite, you can Facebook from Hootsuite. It's a multi-Sophia platform. Google Class, uh, host a log. I didn't ask for that one, but they, that's in the package, so thank you guys for providing me with this exotic new social media outlet, blogs, and some others. So, um, so slightly over 2,000 tweets were captured in archaeology in those languages, including English, and that's not a lot because if you compare it to London Olympics or United States <coughs> elections, this is a very small um, portion of data. But I just did that to show you how to work with this methodology. And another thing about this methodology, it's very popular among uh, political scientists. So right now, during the elections, uh, a lot of political scientists are trying to measure the public opinion. And this is the same methodology they're using. And then the next step is to choose what, what kind of a linguistic processing software you're going to use. My software of choice is called Look, and it's how it's spelled right here. And it's pronounced Look. Seriously pronounced Look. <laughs> Interesting. And it's developed by uh, a, a scientist at the University of Texas at Austin. And this is my suburb of choice, not because I come from Texas, but because a Mason Golder article had that same software. But there are other so software um, opportunities that you can explore. Just ask for, if you have a friend who is a computational linguist or who knows NLP. Um, most of those um, options are based on in Graham Ward recognition and categorization. So uh, just look around. There might be better options than that one because that one is pricey. Uh, but what's I mean, free? So this is uh, the data set of what the, the, the first part of the tweets. And when, when I saw the number 1,500, I was like, 
like, seriously? This is so sad. And that was, it was in three days. So why is archaeology not, not popular? It's sad. We need to engage more. And then I captured more right after. So total, that was about 2,000 tweets. And then this is what it looks like when you process the data in different languages. They give you, um, they give you a sentiment analysis. They assign certain numbers to, um, to each sentiment. And their mechanism works. Um, so for how they developed the software, they uh, had like a focus group of scientists for native speakers of the language. And they would analyze blog blogs and and uh, and uh, blogs and, and writings and, and scientific articles in different languages and then they break them down into different categories and then they would give uh, a mark to each category and then they, they would give it to other scientists who will either agree or disagree in those categories and then some other scientists so it was such a sophisticated research project in 2007 that um, I think that's the reason why a lot of uh, social and political scientists use that. I just, uh, I just personally trust that. If Mason Golder used that, then that's worth it. And so um, then you run statistics, you compare the values for whatever emotional category you're interested in. And they have 89 emotional categories for English and slightly less for other languages. And it, it's, um, it's <coughs> categories are the following from what I remember. Personal, impersonal, uh, egocentric, more collectivist. Um, there was one called the one that was called uh, even sexual. I didn't look at that one for archaeology because naturally, probably the score is not very high. So uh, and then I just I just did a simple positive and negative emotion category analysis, and so this 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 was the result for Italian, French, Spanish, German, and English, and um, so there. Are, in some categories, French was the same. There are not so many tweets about archaeology in French to begin with. Um, and it seems like positive is predominant, but is it? We would need to run statistics. And I just uh, did the simple, I bootstrapped data again and did the distribution of positive and negative emotions to compare if there is really that much difference. And if you can see, if you can look at these two distributions, they're pretty much the same. Um, so the, there's not so much difference if you look at this raw, this is the raw data so before the statistics. Uh, yes, English obviously is super positive, but then again, English like the most popular language, people tweet about everything and write about. Um, so this was the result. Uh, and that's one of the tweets that I came across in another one. So, um, so basically people do tweet about archaeology. <laughs> But as you can see, some people in the archaeology class are thinking about something else. So, yes, and um, and basically things to consider about open access databases. <coughs> is, it, uh, is it legal? That's the question number one in your country, because across different countries it's very different. Um, how is it going to work with the scientific community? Uh, is, it, is it a credible information? Is it uh, something that um, can be published? So those are the things to consider for open access and for tweet, for tweets and generally social media. My only advice is to, if you decide to study, um, make sure that you look at the current network analysis or social science or political science analysis that are available out there and follow the strict and exact methodology because you can't just use some tool. For example, cloud offers positive and emo negative emotion analysis, but then they do not do not uh, explain their methodology and their algorithm. And if there is no algorithm, then how you, are you going to publish and make this credible? So you, you need to use either a software or recognized linguistic uh, software that would actually process the data, and you could then you could play with it and do statistics. So thank you so much for having me here. Thank you.